There are tons of different forms of one of our favorite vitamins, yes. vitamin C. Um, we use multiple forms of vitamin C and in fact, probably a teaser for some additional products that are gonna be developed. New, new stuff, new, teaser. Yeah, new also different forms of vitamin C, but vitamin C is very different than vitamin A. What are the main functions behind formulating with a vitamin C? Right, well I think the thing to recognize first is that if something's classified as a vitamin, it means that it can't be made by the body. We have to get it from an outside source. So typically we refer to the vitamins as things that we take dietary wise, right? They're all things that are required for the body for overall health. Uh, but of course, most of what we take in does not make it to the surface of the skin. Very little, less than 4% most of the time of those nutrients make it to the surface of the skin. So we have an argument of, in particular, in the case of vitamin C, saying that we are topically deficient for vitamin C. When we look at vitamin C specifically, it's the form L-ascorbic acid that is recognized by the body and by the skin. And we do use that in one of our formulations uh, for our back bar treatments. The issue with ascorbic acid as a cosmetic ingredient, and this was discovered early on, is that it's notoriously unstable. Right? It has a tendency to oxidize, in particular when we have it in aqueous water-based solutions. So you'll notice that those products will start to get dark in color, right? It'll actually produce gas, so some of them, the droppers will bubble up and even the product will come out of, out of the dropper sometimes. Uh, and that, of course, is problematic. The other issue is that if it is indeed a stable product, it generally has a relatively low pH, mo low pH most of the time between 3.5 and 4. So uh, th that's an issue in particular for compromised skin types. So if you've got somebody that has rosacea or an inflammatory case of acne or something like psoriasis or eczema where the barrier is compromised, it becomes very uncomfortable to apply those ingredients, that particular form of vitamin C to the skin. So the ingredient manufacturers pretty early on recognized that this was an issue and to be able to stabilize it and make them more uh, user friendly to formulate with, started creating again ester forms, very similar to the use of vitamin A. One of the ones that we use that we highlight a lot that's in our vitamin C reversal serum is magnesium ascorbyl phosphate. So you can kind of look at these ester forms as the active molecule. Again, this is um, ascorbic acid, magnesium and phosphate hooked to either end. And the reason why this is such a great ingredient, I love talking about it because it's such a cool ingredient to work with, um, is because the magnesium and phosphate are used for other biosynthetic reactions in the skin. They do other things once they're applied. And the material itself has a relatively uh, neutral, slightly alkali pH. And once it's applied to the surface of the skin, which is of course slightly acidic, usually around 4.5, 5.5, if it's in a healthy range, uh, that magnesium ascorbyl phosphate, the magnesium and the phosphate portions actually are metabolized off, right? They're, they're broken off and used for other biosynthetic reactions in the skin. And then the ascorbic acid portion is able to penetrate and do all the things that vitamin C does. It works as a free radical scavenger, works as a tyrosinase inhibitor, which helps to lighten and brighten skin. And then of course it's utilized for collagen stimulation in the dermis as well. So all the things that vitamin C does, it's there for. That's one example uh, of vitamin C that we use. There's other forms that, uh, again, as the industry has progressed and evolved, things like tetrahexadecal ascorbate, which is a newer, probably one of the newer forms. It's been around for a while, but it's oil soluble. It's actually been converted to an oil soluble form of a vitamin C that a lot of clients used for um, creams and lotions. There's another called ascorboglucoside, which is extremely gentle. You'll see it used in a lot of eye products. Um, aminopropyl ascorbyl phosphate, which is highly functional as well, similar to the magnesium ascorbyl phosphate, but it has a much broader pH range. And those are, again, just a handful of examples. All of those which we use in the Circadia line, um, but again, the industry just keeps getting better and better. And these are the supply side of the industry, right? When we're talking about different formulations and products, you know, the estheticians that are visiting us and inquiring about the brand that we have and what we offer, this is the education that we provide to them. But a lot of this information comes directly from the suppliers. It trickles down from the manufacturers that we get to work with when we make and we manufacture the products, when we develop the formulations in-house. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a lot about percentages and formulation because that is something that's very unique to Circadia is that we are manufacturing all of our own products. But um, it brings me to my next question about percentages because magnesium ascorbyl phosphate, we can use it at a lower percentage, but still have some of the same clinical data that the higher percentage L-ascorbic has and right. same with the 
BVOSC. I'm not going to say the, the, <laughs> the big long one. Right. Well, the BVOSC, for those watching, is the trade name for the tetrahexyl decal ascorbate. That one. So, yeah. yeah. The one. <laughs> um, but I know that there are certain percentages that you have to be using of BVOSC in order to have those nice brightening claims. Yeah. So, I mean, percentage, tell me a little bit about MAP percentage, BVOSC. Sure. I mean, the percentage is a really broad discussion and it usually relates back to, again, the information that was presented early on about effective dose concentration. So those two terms oftentimes used in um, pharmaceutical, effective dose concentration and bioavailability, right? How much should be used, how much is actually being absorbed into the skin. And it relates into cosmetic and skincare, but those are the terms that are used in pharmaceutical application. So um, the comparison is usually anywhere between 15 to 20 percent ascorbic acid, which is generally recognized as a, an amount that is effective for topical daily application. But again, the issue with stability and intolerability for those clients, sometimes those percentages are, are they just don't work. So um, you can look at magnesium ascorbyl phosphate even at anywhere from five to 10 percent at having somewhat of a comparable 15 to 20 percent bioavailability and the, and the factors of oxidation, um, those are all coming into play and that's research that was published a number of years ago. BVOSC is interesting, again, kind of in a category of its own because it's effective as, as low as 1% even for treating hyperpigmentation. So the manufacturers oftentimes will give us a recommended range in which to use them, um, but you'll see it used at five. We use it at 10% in one of our more popular brightening uh, formulations, which is the bright white serum, and it makes all the difference in the world. Not every ingredient, we talked about this when we discussed vitamin A, should be used at more, 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 more. But vitamin C, again, if it's stable, and it's one of the forms that's more tolerable, like we're discussing now, if you're using it at relatively high concentrations, you're getting a level of bio bioavailability that we want, and also tolerability, so they become extremely effective. There's been a lot of um, popularity recently with microneedling and using hyaluronic acid based products. Um, and there has been some controversy about using vitamin C with the hyaluronic acid in conjunction with microneedling. Yes. Can you um, kind of fill us in on what that concept is and what your thoughts are? Sure, I mean, and, and it makes a lot of sense when you hear people question, why would you be microneedling with vitamin C? Um, it, it comes down again to the pH discussion. So when you microneedle, you're obviously creating channels into the skin. You're essentially creating holes, spaces in the matrix that are allowing whatever you're putting on over the top to penetrate deeper into the skin. So you've gotta be very cautious with exactly what that is. If you're using an ascorbic base vitamin C, again, that's a 3.5 pH. If that gets deep into the skin, you have the potential to create irritation deeper in those levels which can actually have an adverse effect and create what are called granulomas. So it's irritation at a deeper level. So you've got to avoid that, which is why I always tell estheticians, professionals, you have to go with manufacturer recommendations. You have to make sure you're talking to the supplier, whether it's Circadia or any other brand, make sure whoever you're asking, first of all, knows what they're talking about. They actually are well informed. Um, but make sure you're following whatever the um, recommendations are based on the manufacturer because you can create some issues there. Our form, magnesium ascorbyl phosphate, again, slightly alkaline. When I say slightly, it's about a pH of 7.2. So it'll, it is almost neutral. It is perfectly safe to use after microneedling. In fact, we highly recommend it, uh, and there's no chance of it creating those potential granulomas.